Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who promises to provide everything that we need. As Pastor Zach mentioned, the message this morning is based on our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 14. We begin with prayer. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, there's no way, there's just no way, it's impossible. Have you ever said something like that? Or maybe at least thought something like that? You were given a project to do or assigned a task, something was was asked of you, something was expected from you. Or maybe you're facing a problem or a potential problem related to your health or your wealth or your relationships that keep you awake at night or keep you distracted during the day. And you've assessed the situation and you've, you've considered all of the possible options and the only thing that you can conclude is there's no way. Whatever it is, It's bigger than you are, and that's why it bothers you, because you know that there's nothing that you can do about it. You ever felt that way? Maybe feel that way now? Would you be willing to consider the possibility that the impossible situations that you face in your life are not necessarily the Lord sending you a gift-wrapped package of frustration but rather it is the Lord extending to you an invitation, an invitation to trust in Him. That's what happened in a remote area around the Sea of Galilee when the disciples stood in front of Jesus and behind them were thousands of hungry men, women, and children. And in their hands were only five loaves of bread and two fish from a boy's lunch. And Jesus was inviting their trust. Jesus had just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Something that would have hit Jesus hard because John was Jesus' advance man. He was the one who set the table for his ministry. Also his cousin. And so we can understand why Jesus would want to get away from the crowds. Maybe he wanted to grieve in private. Perhaps he just wanted to meditate and pray. And so he went away. He got in the boat, went across the Sea of Galilee. But not long after he landed, the people found out where he was. And so they came to be where Jesus was. And there he spent the whole afternoon helping them and healing them. And that's how they ended up in the predicament that they were in. A whole lot of people... Not a whole lot of food. John's Gospel gives us some more details. He tells us that earlier in the day, when Jesus saw that the people were coming, but before the people arrived, he posed a question to one of his disciples named Philip. Where are we going to buy bread to feed these people? And John says it was a test. And so the disciples had all afternoon to figure out how they were going to get it done. Jesus was busy teaching the people and he was healing their sick and the disciples, were their heads were spinning. And what did they come up with? Philip said eight months' wages isn't going to get enough bread to give everybody a bite. Andrew, another disciple, found that boy with his food, five loaves of bread and two fish. But he had to say, how far can this go? among so many people. So what was their solution? Send the people away. There's just no way. It's impossible. And Jesus said, no, we don't have to send them away. You feed them. You give them something to eat. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish here, Jesus. Bring it to me, he said. And when they did, Jesus told the people to sit down. 
and he gave thanks for the food, and then he gave it to those disciples who in turn gave it to the people. And everyone got something to eat. And there's some things that were not told. When Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish, was it like his miracle at Cana, where the water that he turned into wine was quite possibly the best wine those folks had ever tasted? So when he multiplied the fish, did it taste like a perfectly prepared Friday fish fry? The bread, was it like the, the first service of the, those cheddar rolls that you get at Red Lobster? You know what I'm talking about? They melt in your mouth. We're not told. I'm sure it was good. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all invite us to do the math. They all tell us that there were 5,000 men who were present, plus women and children. And so 15,000 people fed would be a fairly conservative estimate. And there were leftovers. Can you picture what this was like? as a disciple of Jesus? After everyone was fed and they were fully satisfied from their meal, those disciples go out and they, and they gather what's left. And they start coming back one by one. And what was left? Basketfuls. Remember how many? Remember how many? Twelve. And how many disciples? Twelve. One basket full of proof for each disciple of Jesus' desire and his power to provide whatever we need. When it was done, I would guess that Andrew was ready to take back his question about the bread and the wine, or the bread and the fish. How far are these going to go among so many? And I think it's safe to say that Philip... And his 11 friends may have looked back on their frustrating afternoon trying to figure out how they were going to do what Jesus wanted them to do and they thought, I guess we should have known. What do we learn from this miracle? I read some modern theologians who tried to explain it this way. They said that actually a lot of people did bring food. They just hid it under their cloaks because they wanted to keep it for themselves. But then they saw that the boy, he offered up his, his lunch. And so when everybody sat down and they saw that the boy was sharing his food, well, they felt bad about being so selfish. And so they got out their food and they gave it to everybody else. And everyone had enough. And the lesson we learn is it's good to share. It is good to share. But this account isn't about sharing. It's a miracle. And it's about trusting in Jesus. What are we doing with the impossibilities in our lives? Those times when we might feel just like those disciples. Those times when we feel like God has asked us to handle something and we're not quite sure how that's really going to happen. When we think about the tasks that he gives us to do, and the problems that he allows us to face in our homes as a husband and a wife, as a parent and a child, in the workplace as a co-worker and a teammate, in your world as a godly neighbor and a good friend, in your church and in your school as a ministry partner. If you have ever thought that there just isn't enough time, money, resources, health, help, patience, forgiveness, love, and understanding to do what God asked, then you're just like those disciples who had a small amount of food in their hands and they had a whole crowd of hungry mouths to feed. Remember, John said this was a test. And the test came in the form of a question. Where are we going to buy bread to feed these people. To which the common sense answer could only seem to be, there is no way, this is impossible. When tested, the disciples were 0 for 12 in answering, why with this question, Jesus must be asking us to place our trust in him. 
With all the impossibilities that you face in your life and that I face in my life, Jesus isn't putting the screws to us. He's testing us. And he's teaching us to turn to him and to trust in him to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Trust is at the top of the list of what God is looking for from you and from me. But would you agree that when we're in situations like those disciples, we've often reacted in the same way that they did? That doesn't earn us commendation, but condemnation. But look at how Jesus treated his untrusting disciples. He didn't take their heads off for not seeing that the one who was able to miraculously heal all the people who were brought to him that afternoon might possibly be able to handle the evening meal. Now, the Son of God came to earth as one of us not to condemn us for our unbelief. He came to be condemned for our unbelief and to free us from it. The same Jesus who always perfectly trusted in his heavenly Father, who fed the thousands and healed hundreds, is the Jesus who willingly went to the cross so that he could be condemned for you and so that his perfection could be credited to you and so that you might know that there is nothing that he won't or can't do for you if it is good for you. And his tests are not meant to trick you or to trap you, but rather to train you and to teach you to trust in him. When you feel like a disciple with a small amount of food in your hands and a large crowd of people to feed, an impossible task, or you feel like those disciples who failed in a test to trust in the Lord, you need to see that Jesus is with you. And Jesus is for you. And you read it on every page of your Bible. And you wrap yourself up in it when you remember your baptism. And you feast on it when you come to the Lord's table. And you find it in every confession and absolution. Jesus is your powerful and compassionate Savior. And He is here as the one who died for you. And now, now He lives for you. And he lives for you to provide for you. Our reason for taking 15 minutes out of a busy week this morning to hear some words about this miracle is to reestablish and reinforce our confidence in Jesus for his grace and his forgiveness and for our daily bread. And our confidence in Jesus to resolve for us those things in our lives which we seem there's no possible resolution for. Today God shows us 12 disciples who are very much like us. They were really good at doing math and calculating their needs. They just weren't very good at taking their needs to Jesus. And they looked at the work that Jesus gave them to do and they said, it can't be done. We don't have enough. Instead of simply trusting that with Jesus, there's always more than enough. And with this miracle, Jesus is saying, I know, I know exactly what you need. And I will never fail you. And not only will I give you what you need for yourself, I will give you what you need to serve others as you live as my disciple in your home and at your work and in your world and in your church, and in your school. There's no way. There's just no way. It's impossible. Those are words and those are thoughts that Jesus would like to remove from us. And as he did at the remote area around the Sea of Galilee, Jesus stands alongside you today. He's serving the landscape of your life, analyzing right along with you all of the regular needs that you have, needs that would fall under the category of daily bread. He's also taking a look at all of those mountainous problems that you seem to think are insurmountable. 
And he turns his head and he looks at you and he asks that loaded question that he once asked Philip. So how do you think you're going to handle this? After spending time in God's Word today, I pray our response is, Lord Jesus, by asking me that question, you must be inviting me to trust in you, to see to it, to take care of whatever I need. Because there is no task and there is no problem bigger than you. Amen.